Welcome back to the late, late afternoon session of talks. In this session, we have three short talks, uh, about 30 minutes each, and uh, they all focus on extremely interesting topics. Our first speaker will be uh, Carl Brumund from, Di from Dyn, where he's the principal network engineer, and he'll be talking about designing and building uh, large data centers, not Google large, but large. Thanks. So I wanted to talk, come and talk a little bit about uh, data centers, what we call sort of a small, because in the past we've had uh, people like Microsoft come up here and talk about how they've built theirs, which I think are about the size of the hometown that I grew up in. So we were on a slightly different scale and some of the things that we did a little bit differently for that. And right, it's the green button. The, uh, so we're dying. You probably know us from DNS. Um, kind of been doing that for a long time. We also do email, internet intelligence. If you want to know what that is, hit the website. Come ask me later. Um, what we've got, we've got about 28 sites around the world, uh, hundreds of probes, and we're in a bunch of clouds as well. Four core sites, and uh, we're building up regional cores that are going to follow the same model that I'm talking about today. They're building those in uh, Europe and uh, Asia Pacific. So what this talks about is basically a new core sites that we're building, um, the network for those. So first, I want to talk about you know what not to do. So you know, with every success, there's always the um, learning experience along the way. You know, as Doug Adams has that quote there. So the first design that we came up with was basically like this. You know, pretty standard. It's a class design. That sounds fabulous. It gives us redundancy, lots of bandwidth. Um, you know, it looks good. You know, let's go. Let's go. We're going to go to the vendor. Let's place a big order. We'll buy a bunch of stuff. We'll rack it, stack it. You know, let's jump on the CLI, start configuring. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Well, you know, we had to come up with logical. So let's use MPLS because, you know, like, just like BGP solves every problem, MPLS also solves every problem, right? Something like that. So we'll do MPLS VPNs. You know, our top of rack switches are going to be PE, PEs. Sounds good. Yep, they support MPLS. Oh, yeah, that V6 thing. Yeah, 6 VPE. Um, yeah, that didn't quite get supported. So then we kind of asked, and it's like uh, people writing this sort of said, well, V6 wasn't a requirement. What? Huh? So unfortunately, you know, even Bert was ashamed of us. So that's kind of, it's a little bit embarrassing, uh, that part. So kind of what we had to do is sort of, you know, let's do a little sort of a bit of a start over again. Or, um, you know, I kind of like to call the previous, you know, sort of the BK before Carl time. You know. So, you know, let's actually, you know, maybe we'll actually, re actually engineer it this time. What a, what a concept. So we thought the first thing we do is, like, you know, let's actually define the problem, what we're trying to solve here. So we had some legacy DCs, and they're all right. They're pretty good, you know, but they weren't great. You know, we didn't have enough bandwidth, didn't have enough redundancy, didn't have enough security. Um, very traditional, but it's kind of the old school design. And we have a lot of legacy servers and so on. So a lot of stuff that we're doing is m almost more brownfield than greenfield. We're not basically starting from scratch. We've got to accommodate a lot of stuff that's legacy. And the other thing is we're not building DCs that are going to have 10,000 servers in them. So in our particular case, you know, it just has to be good enough, fast enough, and cheap enough. So it's kind of, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect for anything. And we're just going to try and find that sort of that sweet spot there. And in terms of size, I mean, this is like really pretty small that we were doing this. We're starting out with 20 racks. Um, which by now are actually full, so we're already kind of looking at the expanding. So we're thinking, you know, 20 kind of growing to 200 order of magnitude, need something to kind of handle in that range. It's a little bit different than handling the uh, 10,000 racks. So let's kind of get some requirements here. So, you know, kind of had to be good. So it's, you know, you know, main thing is kind of scalable and also the fact that our existing teams can support it because it's really cool as an engineer to come up with all sorts of neat things, and hey, the vendor has a new knob, let's turn that one on. And unfortunately, it's sometimes it's uh, you know, not something they can support. So it kind of had to be something that can uh, be easily supported. We're also really big on using standard protocols. So we didn't want anything that was proprietary. Um, no specific, you know, one vendor's fabric implementation or something like that. We don't want to get locked into something. If something goes wrong, we can always change out later. We can upgrade or whatever. Fast, you know, 
So for our, in our particular case, 10 gig, we're not the 100 gig levels. Um, but so 10 gig, multiple 10 gigs, okay, pretty easy. Cheap, so it's basically can't cost a fortune here. Um, we're not in the networking business, the network's basically to serve the rest of our stuff. You know, it also had to fit us, so right now one of the po popular things to do is uh, overlays. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of legacy and bare metal servers. Putting that in overlays, yes, we can do it, we can't do it easily. We can't easily move them to VMs because, well, because of our developers. Um, so, and the other thing is, the thing had to work, because I'm really getting too old to be paged at 3 a.m. This just really sucks. So, you know, you know, I just want it to work. And, you know, the main thing is it, it kind of had to be better than what we had. You know, as Joe Abley kept telling me, just make it better, Carl. So, the kind of things we had to figure out here, I mean, it's a lot of the basic stuff, you know. Let's actually make the routing work this time, you know, including that, you know, that V6 thing. You know, security, again, you know, make it better, Carl. Um, and service mobility, kind of one of the things is we want to make sure that anything that we do, we can still migrate and move services around. Why? A server dies um, or a VM dies. Oh, we've got capacity in another rack. Make sure we can easily move it over to that. So physical design, version 2.0. Hey, see the design version 1.0. Yeah, it's also called the boss saying, uh, we don't have any more CapEx left to buy this all over again, so can you make it work? Yeah, I think I can, wor I can work with this. So it's, you know, uh, main difference is that, you know, we're not gonna do uh, the MPLS, but basically everything else looked exactly the same. Didn't really have to cable, re-cable anything. So still pretty standard, it's class, we like that. We can scale it uh, horizontally very easily, so this fits this growing from 20 to 200. Yeah, okay, I can work with this. Now, the logical design, so our legacy data center was very traditional, you know, layer two, layer three, in my mind, way too much layer two because almost any layer two is way too much. So we like layer three, you know, it just, it just works better. It was just easier to troubleshoot. So one of the things, of course, is, you know, well, we get in that whole service mobility thing, so okay, we'll have to figure that out. And the other thing we want is, well, we don't want to put everything on the internet. You know, we don't really need the routable IPs for our uh, databases and other stuff. So, okay, I guess we're going to need multiple routing tables then. Well, the whole MPLS thing didn't work, but hey, we've got this, you know, VRF light or, you know, routing instances we can do. Okay, yeah, that would work, but then we're going to have multiple, multiple IGPs if we run IGP, multiple BGPs. Hmm, okay, we'll th need to think about that. Now we get into, remember, we, buy, we bought really cheap layer three switches because it had to be cheap. So how about ribbon fib scaling? Is that gonna be a concern? Well, so I have to think about that. Oh yeah, we're, we're still not ready for the overlay network. So that's still, that's still uh, some point in the future. Or you know, as I like to say, that's gonna be, uh, make sure I have some work in 2016 and I don't get laid off. Because you know, it's always important to have you know, the next project. So we thought, okay, so we're going to do this multiple routing tables. Well, how many do we need? Like, are we going to have like, you know, two or a whole bunch of them? So we kind of came up roughly with about this list. You know, internet accessible, pretty obvious. The stuff that's going to be out there, the internet needs to reach. Stuff that's not internet accessible. Oh, okay, that's pretty easy. Well, we, we also have hardware load balancers and we want to have stuff behind them. We tend to use our load balancers in line. It just works for us. Again, that whole stuff that our NOC is used to and our ops teams are used to and they can support. That's how we operate. Okay, let's keep that. Well, that means we're gonna have to have a separate writing table for the stuff behind our load balancers. Okay, there's three. Between sites. So this was a kind of a late addition because initially I thought, no problem, I'm just going to um, extend each of these existing ones between sites. And what I soon realized is that going between running instances causes a problem. You wind up with asymmetric traffic in a sense of where do you jump running instances. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So basically the short answer was, let's just create one between the sites. That makes life easy. We also want to serve a test one that we don't want, you know, we can't really use that big, uh, the big test network called the internet all the time, only some of the time. So okay, so I'll have you know, a QA, and QA set up. And we've got a whole bunch of stuff that are what we call kind of common systems. Um, this is a lot of our continuous integration pipeline, stuff like our um, our Git, our Hef, Jenkins, um, NTP servers, recursive DNS servers, 
um, a lot of those things. And we want them accessible by both our QA environment and production. And we don't want to have QA accessible um, to be able to access production. OK, so I'll be a six one. OK, six, uh, it's more than I was hoping, but I can live with six. It's not, uh, it's not a huge number. It's not double digits. OK, so reasonable. So logical design, because you know, pictures kind of are you know, worth a thousand words. So we basically, we did something like this. Um, the lines that you see between boxes are effectively bundles of 10 gig links that are trunked so, uh, with sub-interfaces. So we do everything as point-to-point -point links between them. Um, and basically, just try to show the different uh, writing tables here in different colors, just for some clarity. You notice that remote sites, we have connect two different ways. In some cases, we have direct connectivity, as when we buy a layer two circuit from somebody, and we can just run it that way. Other times, we don't have that connectivity because it's just too far away, the site, or the site's not big enough, and it's not worth the cost, so we'll just run IPsec tunnels. So we have basically two ways to get there. Um, you'll also notice that not all of the running instances are extended everywhere. For example, the intersite one never needs to go to a top of rack switch because no server will ever be uh, in the intersite. Um, and also, uh, the load balancer does not need all of the routing instances as well. Now, one of the things we had to also decide is, are we going to do an eBGP or an iBGP? Now, in the past, we've had uh, Microsoft back now in 55 talk about how they used eBGP as their, I, effectively as the, the new IGP. I think that was a, the name of the talk back then. So we looked at eBGP, and one of the concerns we had is that we're gonna have a whole lot of sessions because you're gonna have every top of rack switch will have an eBGP session to the spines times the number of writing instances. So, you know, it winds up being a substantial number. If we lose a single link to a rack, um, then you know, there's gonna be a whole lot of sessions that are gonna flap. So we weren't really sure if the, layer, if the eBGP is really gonna be the right thing. We had concerns about it. Um, we didn't actually test it to see whether or not it would work. Maybe it would, your mileage will vary. Instead, we kind of decided, let's do iBGP. We can use a route reflector that scales. Um, there's a talk this morning about the iBGP stuff. Um, we tried to sort of incorporate a lot of those best practices that I talked about. And the other nice thing about the IBGP is our staff actually understand that model. This again gets back to the whole thing about support, so somebody else can handle it at 3 a.m. and I don't get paged. So, okay, IG, IBGP will work for us. And the main thing is for the IBGP with the route reflectors, total number of sessions is kept, uh, kept under control because it's specifically our spine switches are the ones that we're most, uh, most concerned about the load on those. So then we kind of had to pick a IGP, and this was kind of like a meh, whatever. I mean, really anything, really anything would have worked here. So we went for the, the easy and the obvious choice, OSPF, version two, OSPF version three. Um, why? Because our staff understands OSPF version two. Um, so it just makes it easier. Um, really, um, could have done ISIS, except for the fact it's really hard for us to hire ISIS experts out of the ISPs. Um, so that's not really that good. Um, you know, could have you done OSPF v3 for, also for just for both v4 and v6. However, based on this draft, uh, ITF draft, that was kind of discouraged. So we, like I said, we went with the obvious choice. In the end, this really doesn't matter. Now, one of the things is when you have multiple writing tables, you need to get between them. So if we have a, a web server or a DNS server, or an API server in our public writing instance and a database in private, the two will not want to talk. They may be in the same site, they may be in different sites. So one of the things you have to do now is you have to do write exchange between them. And as was discovered, this can really get confusing fast. So what we did was we basically said, hey, BGP, communities, there we go. Everything tagged with this community is this type of route. We, exp we import, export uh, that way. Um, again, using the VRF light in our particular case, instance import. Almost everything is done on the spines to basically, um, that way it reduces the number of hops that things have to travel. Um, it also gives us the maximum bandwidth because of ECMP. So, and then everything keeps uh, symmetrical. There's a couple exceptions to that, but almost everything, well, being on the spines between the, uh, between the RIs. 
Now, once you start doing multiple routing tables and doing route exchange, yes, I do have the same route in multiple routing tables, so therefore my total number of routes grows. Again, the whole ribbon, uh, rib concern for rib scaling. We've run some numbers there. Um, based on actually the routes that we're seeing right now, it's actually pretty, much, pretty okay. And we actually, we were expecting to actually have to upgrade our spines to uh, ones with larger memory, and that's actually something that we can actually push out just because we're not seeing the route table growth as high as we were, were at first fearing. So one of the things when we did IBGP, and we talked about this, is, or was, uh, talked this morning on uh, route reflectors, is the route reflector will only ever give you a best path. Ah, okay, well, can't, we soon realized that we have a failure scenario. So in our particular case, we, do, we deploy a pair of top of rack switches. Servers are connected to both top of rack switches. Those top of rack switches basically announce the routes to the route reflector, which then it sits on our edge MXs. Yes, we're a vendor J shop. Um, and then the spines are clients. So the spines will only ever get a best route. Well, what happens if the route that the spines get, they can't reach? Well, then they'll probably follow default, go back up, and we can wind up with loops. Maybe eventually the packet gets there. So that really sucks, you know, because you know, asymmetric routing and loops, and it's all bad. So what we decided to do is like, hey, you know, we've got this server that's in a rack. Let's just do effectively a anycast loopback that we'll put on both spines and make that the next hop. Well, that's pretty good. That's cool. Hey, actually, that solves a whole lot of ECMP stuff too. So now actually we're, we can actually get ECMP down to, uh, down to the rack. So it actually uses uh, traffic goes down to both the, uh, the top rack switch A and top rack switch B. And if there's a failure scenario, it just routes around it. And it uses the active link. So this was really cool. This actually works well. One of the other things we had, being a DNS company, we, te we tend to do a little bit of any cast. And one of the other problems, again, it's the same thing because of IBGP and route reflectors. What's the best route when you have four, or six, or 10 Anycast uh, servers all announcing the same route? Um, all of them. Well, no, only just one. Well, that's, again, not really what we call Anycast. So we had to come up with something here, and we came up with different things. And the main thing we also want to do here is we didn't want to love network state. So we're not going to do something special for this. It can't be something that because of this server, we have to put something in. Because when the server moves or goes away or does something, you forget, always forget about that state. So one of the things we did on this was kind of say, well, how many Anycast routes will we have? And we figured it out, and we kind of went, eh, maybe a couple dozen at the most. That's kind of our maximum that we're seeing. Well, that's not really much, so that's ah, screw it. We're just going to dump it into our, our uh, IGP, put them in OSPF. It's not a huge number. Hey, that gives us an ECMP. It just works. Cool. You know, it's, yes, it's this, it just has to be good enough. So security. So our legacy data center does a standard security. We do ACLs, we have firewalls, and it's a problem. Things move, things change, and what happens, the network guys are always the last ones to know, it always gets blamed, you know, Everybody always blames the firewall, everybody always blames the network guys. So you know, the answer was, you know, just no more security in the network. So what we basically said is, okay, we're not gonna do security in the network, well, we're not just gonna do no security. Now we're gonna actually push it all the way down to our instances, be those, or the servers or the VMs. So what we basically told the squads is, you guys are developing, you guys own the service, you own the application, you also own the security for it. You guys have written it. You guys should know your own flows. So go and basically put that on there. Now, the other cool thing was in the past, normally you put an ACL in front of a VLAN. Well, what happens if somebody gets in? Well, the blast race is basically the VLAN. Here, the blast race has been narrowed down to be a single instance. So, hey, this is cool. This is actually much better. Oh, yeah, and it's less work for us. So there's less network state. This is, again, kind of making things easier. Less stuff that breaks at 3 a.m. Now, of course, when we're doing this, we've got to figure out a way to basically deploy the security in an easy way. So one of the things we do is we're using a lot of our continuous integration pipeline for this. So effectively what happens is when, a, when we first build a server or a VM, we'll actually install base security right away. And that base security is effectively monitoring an SSH so the guys can get into the box. That's it. Now, the service owners themselves will have to go in, and because we use Chef, they'll go in and add to the cookbooks, what they need opened up. 
And one of the things we're trying to do is to encourage them to be as restrictive as possible within reason. Um, because it's all automated, we can make things, uh, you know, it's a bit easier to deploy and so on. Um, if we're deploying a Cassandra cluster where we've got 20 nodes that are all doing the same thing, one cookbook applied to all 20, thank you very much, have a nice day. Um, one of the other things we're doing here is also automate audits and verification because we know people get lazy. So we kind of need to remind them that, you know, please don't be stupid. You know. So unfortunately, this wasn't the best because people really didn't like having to do more work. Before it was really easy. The network guys just took care of it and they could, we could blame somebody else and we could, you know, um, you know have it as being uh, their work. So it actually took quite a long time to convince a lot of our service owners, our developers, that basically this is actually a good thing. And what's really surprising is one of our most vocal critics who had many well, discussions with me, at the end of it, was completely on board. So this is actually possible. Once you, it just takes a little while for people to uh, fully realize this. Now, the final thing we had to think about was service mobility. So now we have a whole layer three network. We do a um, different subnets for each rack. Well, what happens if something has to move? You know, so I'm moving from one to another. I'm going to change IPs. Well, that kind of works, but doesn't really. Remember, we're doing IP tables, which are all IP address based. Yes, I know my examples are only v4. There wasn't enough room here to draw in the v6 address and still make it readable. Um, so, you know, it's like, well, what if we didn't have just the interface IP as what the service uses? What if we had this thing called, like, you know, have a service address, an address for the service itself that isn't tied necessarily to an interface? So we did this thing of service IPs. Basically create dummy zero interface on our Linux boxes, and we'll, ha we'll use uh, ExaBGP and the instance. Again, this is being a uh, chef cookbook that just gets deployed when everything gets built, and it's just going to announce the IP, the IP address or addresses that are bound to it, and there's your service. That seems like a really cool idea, and it really was. And for a bunch of stuff, it worked really well. And then we deploy a Cassandra cluster that really does not want to bind outbound traffic to any particular interface, and it all fell apart. So this is a, one of these things that when it works, it works really well. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for everything. We could have done fancy stuff to try and uh, get everything to do this. Well, you know, you do as much as you can. But overall, this has actually worked, uh, this worked pretty good. And for a lot of times, this is, again, one of those things where the developers up front really don't like this because it's more work for them up front. But when all of a sudden something goes down at 3 a.m. and we have to spin a VM or server up in another rack really fast, this will make life a lot easier because there's a whole lot less stuff to change. So one of the other things we uh, did here when we were doing this is we wanted to basically also make sure that this stuff was easy to deploy, but more importantly, it's also easy to expand. Remember this whole, we're going from 20 to 200, we want to grow by an order of magnitude. So the whole idea is we're not going to go in and manually configure stuff. This really sucks. Really hate manual configuration almost as much as I hate layer two. So one of the things we did is like we automated all this. So hi, Carlos. The, uh, so we use Kipper, which Carlos talked about back in Nanox 63. Effectively, all of our top of rack switches are fully automated. If you go in and make a manual configuration, it'll be overwritten. So everything there is done. So if we want to add another 100 racks, not really a big deal configuration-wise. Rest of the network, it's getting there. Um, it's sort of what we call kind of, you know, partially manual, partially deployed. Um, the idea is we want to move completely to 100% automated uh, network deployment basically just to make life easier for ourselves. And because such, so many things are so common, so um, this is really making life a lot easier, particularly when we have to do, you know, oh, we have to do this one little change across so many devices. Oh, oh, that's no, no big deal. You know, we should do a simple uh, kipper push and there, off it goes. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we learned. I mean, this is, yeah, this is like, you know, pretty basic, but, um, you know, you know, Design that's actually documented in advance, hey, you know, there's a concept. Um, you know, one that actually can be implemented, that's even better. Um, you know, trying to use uh, M plus VPNs when you don't have 6VP support, bad thing. Um, the other thing is that there's always a tendency to kind of, let's take the easy way out. Oh, we'll fix it later. You'll never fix it later. We never fix it later. The only time we fix it later is when we rip it out and replace it. So let's try and design it right. Um, you know, we try to validate as much as we can before we deploy. Never enough, but anyway. 
Integrating the legacy stuff was really hard. The legacy cruft that we had, that was really hard. Um, and like everything, everything's, you know, your mileage may vary. Some things on the network side, you know, cheap layer three switches, we all love them. Unfortunately, they come with limitations, rib size, fib size, TCAM features, you know, it's the same OS, oh, except for this box, which doesn't do all of those things. Um, the multiple routing tables, yes, they are a pain, won't lie. I would still do it the same way over again. A few of them was okay. You know, automation, oh my God, that rocks. Seriously, if you guys don't do automation, do automation. Um, BG communi BGP communities, that was just like, that's just a no-brainer. That made life so much, e so easy. You know, tagged her out at the beginning, racked on the community. We do not have a single uh, ACL or prefix uh, list um, or IP access list in our network. Don't need it. It's all just based on communities. Um, the other thing we learned is no such thing as partially in production. As soon as you put that first service on, it's live. All of a sudden, now you have to do change windows. And staff experience levels, really kind of important there. Um, don't, you know, we re learned we can't deploy something that people can't support. Um, security, moving security to the instances, that was really the right decision. That was probably the best thing that we did. Um, commercial solutions to do that, they just suck. Really, guys, get your stuff together. Um, IPv6 support, hello. Um, we rolled our own. Why? Because we had to. Um, we, were, we actually wanted to buy somebody else's. No, nobody can actually do what we needed. Um, their scary thing was a bunch of people who actually developed the code, they actually don't know their own flows because they've never had to think about it before. So it's a real education and learning experience. We basically held the hand of a lot of our squads to get them on board. Yes, you will have to spend time with it. Um, it's just how it works. What we learned about our users, they don't like change. Our users being our developers, the people who uh, run the applications on their network, they really hate change when they have to do more work. So that was a, that was a big selling thing there. The other thing was like, we really had to be involved with our development squads, effectively almost embedded with them. Uh, I mean, there were, there were meetings at least weekly with them to basically get stuff there. We were writing uh, IP tables, cookbooks for them, doing all sorts of stuff. And actually, it was actually probably more work than uh, actually building the whole network, which is kind of doing all that stuff. So, you know, just kind of summing things up. I mean, there's many different ways to build data centers. This is what we did. This works for us, might work for you. You know, there's that, you know, YMMV. The, uh, the main thing here also for us is that we're not in the network biz. Our network here is just basically to connect servers that run the apps that provide the services that our customers buy. So in the end, the network for us wasn't really the biggest thing. The users, the business, and funny enough, all our legacy stuff actually trumps all that. Why all the legacy stuff? Because we have to incorporate it. And our users, because they're the ones actually using it, and that's what they're providing the services that really is our business. Thank you. Hi, uh, Chris Woodfield with Twitter. Um, you'd mentioned the fact that you were having issues because the route reflectors could only advertise one route down to the clients. Uh, was there a reason that um, you couldn't implement the ad path feature to uh, send more than one route down? Uh, ad path is only supported in INET zero. It does not support work in running instances. Okay, fair enough. We did think of that. Hey, uh, Andrei Hemikov with uh, Athena Health. Um, how do you, so if you put security down to an instance, do you ever have to deal with audit? And if so, how do you audit that? That's why we do have a uh, auditing tool in place to uh, do that. It's similar to auditing a ACL or firewall rules in a, in a stateful firewall. So we're not finding any difference there. And our security, internal security team is fully on board with this. So do you have to audit each individual box or you just audit the templates and assume they're properly deployed? Uh, no, we actually have to audit down to the server level. Dep it depends a little bit on what we're doing, but we actually do all, all the way down to what is actually deployed, not just what we thought was deployed. And now with the service owners and potentially developers managing their own security, um, do you generally trust them in that sense? Yes, because we all work for the same company. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting explanation, thanks. Uh, Mike Joseph, Google Access. Um, not to 
sort of a champion, one of our own uh, solutions, but Google open sourced a system a while ago called Caprica that's fairly useful for managing ACLs, and I noticed you mentioned that you weren't happy with commercial solutions, um, so I don't know if you've looked into it, but it allows you to generate ACLs both of the network and the server and the system layer. Um, that would allow you to sort of have a common ACL framework and still push ACLs where you want them, and if you want them at the network layer, you can apply them there too. Okay, thank you. We'll look into that. Sure. Thank you. 